Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this session. Uh, I think there's been a fair amount of buzz about it, and uh, we hope to live up to those expectations. Uh, I'm Danny Leipziger, and I'm the Managing Director of the Growth Dialogue and a professor at uh, George Washington University. Um, and I'm delighted that you've come to this uh, session. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and interest in the Belt and Road Initiative. It's one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects uh, in recent memory. Uh, and there are also a number of questions that surround it. And uh, we have a, uh, a very uh, important uh, and star-studded panel to help us get some of the answers and tease through some of these uh, important questions. Uh, so to give you a sense of how the uh, session will manage to be managed, uh, we will start off with a presentation by Dr. Carolyn Freund, who is the Director for Trade, Competition, and Investment Climate, I think, uh, at the World Bank. And uh, she will give us some of the basic information uh, that will help our panel. Our panel, just so that you know, uh, includes Vice Minister of Finance uh, Jia Zhou from uh, China, uh, David Dollar, uh, Senior Fellow at Brookings, uh, and uh, Mr. Kaur from AMRO uh, Macro Research. Uh, and I'll introduce them to you more fully uh, later. But uh, what we'd like to do is get started so that we uh, use our time efficiently and come away uh, better informed uh, and also uh, better able to see the benefits uh, and costs of the uh, BRI initiative. So I'd like to call on Dr. Carolyn Freund, and she will uh, do a PowerPoint uh, in uh, 15 minutes or so, and uh, then we will move on to the panel. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, thank you, and thanks everyone for coming. I guess, okay, it's already up there. Um, the, there. There seems to be a lot of passion around the Belt and Road Initiative. Some people are concerned about it uh, and the implications of uh, building such a large infrastructure problem, a project, and how that might affect debt or uh, environmental and social concerns, but there's also a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, from the Belt and Road Initiative. If we just think back before the railroad age, commodities were actually transported by oxen or bullocks, and they could only go 30 kilometers a day. Once railroads were built, they could travel 600 kilometers a day. This had huge implications for development. The MIT economist Dave Donaldson has looked at the development of railroads in India, for example, and he finds that the network of railroads, 67,000 kilometers built in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, really affected connectivity, trade, investment in these areas, leading to 20% boost in welfare. So these are the gains. And what we're doing in our World Bank study is considering the potential gains for the recipient countries, as well as how to manage the risks that come with any large infrastructure project. So what I'm going to do today is just quickly run through this study that we hope to complete uh, by the spring of next year, starting with telling you a little bit about what the Belt and Road Initiative is, what are the connectivity gaps in the region, and they're, they're quite large, so that's why there's such a big potential. Talk about the economic effects, trade and investment, and just greater connectivity can bring, and then give you some concluding remarks. So just to start to think about what the BRI is, it's an ambitious uh, effort to improve connectivity in the region. Um, it consists of six corridors. We have the road, which runs through the maritime, and then the belt, which runs across uh, the Eurasian continent. 
And for this study, we're going to focus on the 71 economies that fall along these corridors. And this is a really big group. It accounts for 30% of GDP, 60% of population, and 40% of world trade. And I want to pause here for a minute to think about why you'd want to have a coordinated effort to improve connectivity. For any country, building a road has some value, but it also has value to the countries around it that the government of any individual country may not internalize. So there's a spillover that wouldn't be taken into account if each country just decides on its own how to do infrastructure. There's also a timing issue that for any country, it really matters what the other countries are doing. And so coordination matters. How do you coordinate all this infrastructure so it comes at the same time, it connects with rail? We know that's important. The rail links have to connect. So for these reasons, it's important to have a coordinated plan rather than just individual plans. Um, so what we've done is one issue we came across in trying to do this study is that there isn't really a good data set out there on the Belt and Road. So being the World Bank, we have offices in the countries around the region. So we went to these offices and we asked them to t tell us about the projects that are going on in their countries. And then we also used news reports. And we put together a data set focusing only on the part that has to do with uh, connectivity. So we're, we're not going to be looking at the energy part of the BRI. We're just looking at the transport infrastructure. Um, and what you can see is that there are improvements to rail. Those are the pink lines. Um, there's improvements to road. There's new ports, new maritime ports, new dry ports, as well as improvements uh, to ports. So just before I go into um, some of the research part, let me just quickly go over the opportunities and the challenges. So I've mentioned a lot of the opportunities, improved infrastructure, more trade, more investment, higher growth, bringing in lagging regions. But there are challenges as well. What if you build the wrong infrastructure and it gets stranded? You have to coordinate all this infrastructure investment as well. There are environmental and social risks. Um, there's issues to do with public procurement. And sustaining public debt can become an issue because these projects are expensive. Uh, so we have some opportunities, some challenges. But keep in mind, these are the opportunities and challenges that would come with any large infrastructure project. They might be more um, intense to some extent in this case because of the governance in some of the countries, but these are concerns that would come in any such project, and there's a big opportunity for growth. So just to quickly look at the um, connectivity gaps, there are large disparities uh, across the regions in terms of trade, so we know East Asia. Uh, both trades a lot, and trade has grown a lot since 1995. We've seen trade growth in the other regions, and these are just the countries in the BRI in those regions. We've seen trade grow uh, in all the regions, but there's really big difference across where East Asia has been much more involved in world trade than the other regions on the BRI. And Estimates from economic models show that the, these economies actually under trade with each other. So according to their size and wealth, they should be trading about 30% more with each other. There are also um, problems with just overall infrastructure and how much there is. 
So McKinsey uh, finds that the world would need three trillion in infrastructure annually, and according to the ADB, about half of that is needed in this region. BRI economies tend to do poorly or, or a little below average in terms of how their logistics work based on our logistics performance indicator. And there's also, again, a lot of disparity in the region where three of the best performing countries uh, are in this region and three of the worst performing are as well. There's also reasonably high trade policy and um, uh, gaps in the region in the sense that tariffs tend to be still pretty high. And if you're thinking about global supply chains and there's a high tariff, then every time a part is crossing one of these borders, it's facing that tariff. So it's hard to pull into a global supply chain because these are cascading. So in order to really make this effort work, more would need to be done on the policy side as well, as well as there are delays at the border. So if you fix the infrastructure, but then trucks sit at the border for 10 hours, it's not going to have the kind of impact as if these kind of border compliance costs come down. And in particular, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East and North Africa, it's important that tariffs and border delays uh, work come down in order for this to have the full impact. So finally, let me get to the economic effects of the BRI. Um, so how did, we, how did we use this data? What we did is we used geographical information systems data, which is what you use every time you get in your car and you know how long it's going to take you to get somewhere. And we looked at how long it took in 2013. Then we take the infrastructure that's both um, built or planned to be built. We know how uh, fast, how, how much that should improve the speed, speed of transport based on what type of rail or what type of road it is. We impose that on the system and we say how much will trade costs come down. Overall, and, and it affects countries outside the BRI as well, because when they send goods there uh, to BRI countries, they get to take advantage of these new systems as well. So overall, what we see is reductions of about 3%. Um, but on some corridors, it's much more, 13%. And then within the sections that are being improved, it can be as much as 50%. So this has um, important implications for welfare. Using these, we can run a CGE model, a standard computable general equilibrium model that's used in trade often to estimate the gains. And we find that welfare gains are about 1.5% for BRI economies, uh, about 3 quarters of a percent for the world. But they're really high for particular countries such as Laos, Cambodia, and Nepal. Um, but again, they're much bigger if we consider policy barriers as well. So if policy barriers are also uh, taken into account, not just the infrastructure, the gains double. Um, in addition to, uh, to looking at a CGE model, we do some other work as well. We look at a structural trade model, which is similar to the one that uh, Dave Donaldson used on India and the rail. It has the advantage, unlike a CGE, which thinks about international trade, it takes into account trade within countries between regions. And that's where a lot of the gains come from because of this new infrastructure that's improving connectivity along the infrastructure. The gains are much bigger when you consider this type of structural trade model. Um, and then also if we consider the effect on FDI, there are additional gains as well. Now, as I said, this is all work that has been um, published so far. We have these papers online. It's part of a bigger study. We're going to look at the risks that I mentioned as well. But given that debt has become a 
on a more important topic recently, and there are some concerns, I think there's even a debt event later today, uh, we also look at debt. Um, and, and I just want to make two points here, really. One, the external debt from non-Paris club, which includes China, is actually pretty small if we look at the overall BRI region. But if we look at the low-income developing countries, then external debt is, is from the non-Paris club members is high in, uh, in the countries that are actually most at, at, re at risk for debt distress right now. So this is a concern, um, one, because it, it's not as transparent as some of the other debt. Um, we don't know the lending terms, so it's harder to think about sustainability when you don't know the exact terms. And finally, for debt resolution, um, it can become more complicated. So there is some concern here, but it's good to keep it in context. Um, and so finally, I'll conclude looking at, uh, just to say what we've gone over. So there's big effects on trade and welfare for many of the BRI countries. So it's very important to keep in mind the gains from connectivity. There are some policy barriers still in place, so we need complementary policies or we won't reap the full, or the countries won't reap the full benefits uh, from the BRI. So this includes reducing these border delays, reducing trade barriers, FDI restrictions, so forth, um, standard doing business type of uh, reforms. And finally, we need to uh, manage these risks Debt sustainability seems to be high on people's mind, but there are also risks to govern it with governance, environmental and social concerns, as well as coordination problems um, and lack of data can magnify these. So that's the end of my presentation. Just to end with some action we can take, I think one thing that would really help is just to have better data around this, both on the projects, um, and uh, uh, around the lending terms and so forth so that we can really think about it and coordinate better. Um, and I'll conclude with those thoughts on how we can, we can get to there. We are planning to make the data set we put, we've put together public. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, uh, for a very clear and crisp uh, presentation. Um, Caroline, uh, you should know, uh, prior to uh, her current job, uh, was the chief economist for uh, one of the uh, regions, MENA, uh, at the World Bank, and a senior fellow at uh, Peterson uh, Institute. So now I'd like to ask our panelists to come up uh, the, in, in the uh, order in which I uh, ask you. Uh, Joe Zai is a is the vice minister of finance of uh, China. Uh, Madam Joe is also has uh, the distinction of having been an executive director at the World Bank uh, and uh, director general at the Ministry of Finance, assistant minister, and now uh, since June uh, the vice minister. So, Madam Joe. Our second panelist is Dr. David Dollar, who's a senior fellow at uh, the Brookings uh, Institution. Uh, Dr. Dollar was, at one point, a country director for China for the World Bank, uh, and then the uh, U.S. Treasury's economic and financial emissary uh, in uh, Beijing. So, Dr. Dollar. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, Dr. Hoi Kaur is the chief economist for AMRO, uh, doing work on macro research uh, in this part of the world. Prior to that, he was the deputy director of the uh, East Asia uh, and Pacific Department at the IMF, and also worked at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So, Dr. Kaur.
Okay, uh, I think I'd like to start after that uh, very good presentation on the uh, uh, BRI uh, with the Vice Minister. Um, and uh, there's no doubt that there are tremendous uh, potential benefits for many countries, uh, not only China, but uh, uh, others. Uh, but in the past couple of years, there have been some concerns raised about uh, environmental standards of projects, about some of the financial arrangements surrounding these BRI investments. And so I know that China takes these things very seriously and probably has internalized some of these concerns and some pushback in some countries. So my question to you, Vice Minister, is how has China's approach to the BRI and the way it deals with countries in which these investments occur uh, changed uh, since its inception? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, before I address the question uh, you asked, uh, let me say a few words that I highly appreciate the subjects today, that is the economics of the Bat and the Road Initiative. When we talk about economics, it would inspire us to have a more uh, intellectual discussion. But any intellectual discussion has to be based on data and facts. So I highly appreciate the presentation uh, made by Caroline. And she provided us a lot of data and facts so that we can draw on and make our own judgment and intellectual insights on the BRI initiative. Um, having said this, let me say a few words on the questions uh, Danny raised. Uh, on the uh, uh, criteria and standards uh, when we conduct this uh, BRI initiative. Uh, I think to understand China's approach uh, on the standards, uh, we have to look at it at the three dimensions. The first one is that the BRI initiative also aims to the high quality and high standards in developing those uh, physical and policy connectivity. So the first dimension is that the BRI initiative draws on and uh, also respects the international standards. Uh, so we share the same vision that the infrastructure uh, projects and other projects need to be of high quality with high standards uh, in terms of uh, uh, economically, environmentally, socially, uh, and also in terms of good governance. Then the second dimension is that uh, the high standards and high quality need to be localized to the country's specific conditions. Uh, I think China, uh, along our own experience of development, we also did a lot of localization uh, for the uh, so-called international standards. And we uh, uh, used a lot of uh, uh, MDB financing, including the World Bank and ADB. Uh, I myself engaged a lot of uh, uh, such a practice. Uh, I still remember that uh, over, say, 20 or 27, uh, 25 years ago, we localized the World Bank procurement guideline uh, to the to the China's country condition. And we drafted a, a kind of a, a procurement guideline to the Chinese projects financed by the World Bank. We will not literally translate uh, the World Bank's procurement guideline, uh, but uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, adaptation uh, to build a bridge between the, uh, uh, the World Bank's guideline uh, and China's local condition but still in line with the World Bank standards. Uh, and that Chinese guide, that guideline for the Chinese procurement for the World Bank projects uh, proved uh, uh, that it, it's, it worked well. So I think localization is very important to crystallize those uh, high standards uh, into uh, each of the individual countries and projects. And the third dimension is that we have to uh, when we pursue those uh, high standards, uh, it has to be cost effectiveness. Uh, we have to be in line with the market rule uh, because most of the BRI uh, projects actually is commercial based. Uh, 
ERI initiative is not an uh, official uh, aid-driven program. It's different from the Marshall Plan. It is a development initiative based on the, uh, uh, the market mechanism and driven by the uh, uh, market forces and also the, uh, uh, have to be in line with the market rule. So the cost effectiveness is very important to make the investment and the projects actually uh, happen. Uh, when we say that we apply a, a set of uh, high standards economically and socially and environmentally, we cannot pretend that those, uh, uh, those high standard is without cost. There is a, a compliance, compliance cost in each of the projects. So the compliance cost has to be within the limit of affordability uh, for each of the individual countries. So, so I think the cost effectiveness is also very important uh, to deliver those uh, high quality and standards. So those are our basic uh, uh, approach with three dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Minister. Um, I think uh, drawing on your comment that uh, the projects need to be uh, viable and uh, market driven and affordable, I'd like to ask uh, David Dollar. Um, there's uh, a recent paper out by the Center for Global Development that tries to uh, uh, tease together the data that's available on some of the financing of uh, BRI projects, and they come up with, uh, I think, eight countries uh, that they put in a danger zone on debt sustainability as a result of BRI. They were presumably close to that before, and this sort of tips them over the edge. Um, so what's your view on, on the debt sustainability, and what advice would you give to China, because they are the creditors? Uh, for these um, projects. Okay, thank you very much, Danny. Great pleasure to be here to be on this panel. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a paper from Center for Global Development looking at the debt sustainability, and the finding is consistent with what Caroline has in her PowerPoint and actually with some of my own research. Most of the countries borrowing from China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative are in pretty sound fiscal condition and are not really at great risk of debt distress. The paper Danny mentioned found that of about 70 countries involved, eight of them are at pretty serious risk of debt distress. So I would say for a small number of countries, there is a serious concern, but for the vast majority of countries that are involved, there's not really any danger at the moment. Now I think if you dig a little bit deeper, I would just pick up on the comment that Vice Minister Zhou made a moment ago, that this is largely commercial. And while we don't have a lot of details about the lending, you know, we do have details about some specific projects. A lot of Pakistan's borrowing is at about 5 or 6 percent interest rate. Sri Lanka was borrowing at 5 or 6 percent interest rate. A lot of these are 10 to 15 year loans, and in fact, they're often at variable interest rates. So as the Fed raises the cost of borrowing in dollars, clients are actually going to have to pay higher. So I think what you find is that some low income countries really lack capacity to service debt at this kind of interest rate. Uh, and th th I think that external debt is different than domestic debt. Ultimately, it has to be serviced with exports. So it's important to look at the overall debt sustainability. And for some of the low-income countries, and also for Pakistan, which is, is not low-income, you know, there really is a serious issue. So I guess my advice to China would be, look more at this fiscal sustainability issue, debt sustainability, and consider giving more concessional loans to countries that really can't afford to borrow at commercial rates. You know, or if China, which is itself a developing country, if China can't afford that kind of concessionality, then you may have to pull back on projects in some areas because you know, Pakistan is now going to the IMF one more time you know, we are finding some countries that are, are just not able to service the debt that they're taking on. But I come back to the point we see in all these studies, most of the countries borrowing are not at risk of debt distress, so we should put this in perspective. Thank you, David. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Kaur because uh, it's always good to uh, uh, get other independent views on issues. Uh, so on the debt sustainability, for example, uh, I noticed in Caroline's presentation, she highlighted Laos, Nepal, and Cambodia as countries where there would be 
potentially large welfare gains. Uh, it also turns out that these are countries for whom their debt profiles are heavily China dependent. They, have, they owe a lot to China. Um, so from your vantage point, um, how should countries approach debt sustainability? There are these projects that, that have uh, potentially good rates of return. Um, but as we know, some projects pan out, some projects don't. Um, and, but at the end of the day, the country's on the hook to pay. So uh, how do you see this debt sustainability issue? Oh, well, first let me say thank you to World Bank for inviting me to this forum. Uh, yeah, so in EMRO, we do a surveillance of the countries and they comprise the ASEAN and the plus three countries, so altogether about 14 economies. And indeed, uh, debt sustainability is a big concern for us uh, when we do this uh, surveillance. Uh, in fact, last year, when we were doing the regional surveillance, uh, we were very worried that, uh, you know, with, uh, and Trump had just come into office with rising interest rates and the trade uh, protectionism, that it may derail the recovery of the region. Uh, the region has sort of flattened off in 2016 and just about to pick up. As it turns out, last year was a banner year, you know. Uh, markets was relatively calm. There was no protectionism was, you know, was, didn't come in, kick in yet. And so the region actually grew very strongly last year, 5.6%. And this year, it looks like there's been some moderation, but it's just coming off from a high base and still relatively robust. But this is a year when interest rates have started to uh, kick up, you know, pick up. And trade protectionism had kicked in. So it is indeed a big concern to us uh, because uh, it can possibly derail the, the recovery for many countries in the region. And, and you know, the, the region comprises, you know, in terms of the debt sustainability issues, of course, we have, we have Japan with the public debt, uh, we have China with the corporate debt, but our focus very much is on the emerging markets and the low-income economies, right? And for the emerging markets, as you know, uh, you know, and, and I see from the chart that Caroline presented, uh, much of the debt, about half of it was born and other, right? Uh, many of them had graduated from, um, you know, low-income status. They have to go to capital markets to borrow in order to finance the capital expenditure. And after the experience of the global, of the Asian financial crisis, many of them had become very risk at first, right? And one of the casualty of that is that, you know, they do not spend enough on infrastructure. And we see infra, uh, investment collapsing after the global financial crisis and, and growth taking a big hit, actually, you know, coming down by about one or two percentage point across most countries in the region. And so now is, we see that you know, many countries are desperately trying to catch up uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure spending in Indonesia, in Philippines, and uh, Malaysia, of course. It, they, they also have quite a lot of infrastructure program. Uh, and the problem is when you borrow from the market, right? Uh, you know, after the Asian financial crisis, they tell you that okay, you have a double mismatch, your currency mismatch, and your maturity is mismatch. You should avoid the currency mismatch, and so develop your own bond market, you know, in order to uh, facilitate borrowing and, and spending. But what happened then is foreign investors buy into your bond, right? <laughs> and they are very, you know. They can be risk averse, and when they so you have the risk off, risk, risk on uh, capital flow problem, and when they sell off, it becomes a big problem for the economy. So they cannot really build up debt, you know, to the extent that they need in order to facilitate uh, infrastructure spending. And so, you know, to me, the the BRI is a great initiative because we know there is a huge infrastructure gap in the region that needs to be filled, and financing has always been an issue, right? Uh, you want to rely less on the kind of a uh, volatile uh, capital and try to lock in your lending at a longer maturity and preferably at a lower rate. And we know that there's a market failure issue here because most of the you know, private capital, they want 18% return on the, on, on the capital, which is, <laughs> and I think for most infrastructure projects, too high a hurdle uh, to, to, to meet. So I would say that you know the, the BRI is a, is a great initiative, and you know in terms of sustainability of debt uh, from emerging markets, the issue is also the volatility of debt for the for the low income countries. You know the three that you mentioned, uh, Myanmar of course is coming out from a very low base. The debt is only about 10% of GDP; it's not really an issue. 
uh, the two countries that we focus on, Laos and Cambodia. Cambodia, because it's a dollarized economy, actually has attracted a lot of uh, FDI inflows, and they have managed to build up the reserve to a very strong level. So we don't, we don't really see a risk there. Uh, can, Laos is a, is a, is a somewhat uh, different case because they're trying to capitalize on their natu you know, natural resources in terms of water to build hydroelectric dam that can help them to earn revenue. In. But there's a, you know, a mismatch in terms of when those infrastructure projects are able to generate revenue and the borrowing that you, 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 know, you incur. So potentially there could be a, 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 a debt sustainable issue in the traditional sense of repayment. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. Um, Can I also say a few words on this debt issue? On the debt issue? Yes, we, we, we would like uh, to hear it, and we would also like to follow up on the question of the uh, uh, transparency of the debt so that we can do some better debt analysis. Because Mr. Kaur said that uh, we don't want to rely on short-term volatile debt, which is true. Um, uh, so longer maturity debt is preferable, but we also uh, probably could uh, know more about the terms and we'd be able to do a better job. Yeah, uh, well, just uh, a few uh, supplemental words on this uh, debt issue. Uh, first uh, is that the Chinese government, we attach a lot of importance to the debt sustainability when we are pursuing this uh, BRI uh, because we are the creditor, uh, we are the stakeholder, those are our money. And what we are going to do is that we, uh, because the uh, BII initiative is uh, financed in a quite uh, decentralized and in mo most cases the financial, uh, the uh, commercial way, so uh, the Chinese government is encouraged those uh, lenders to develop their debt, debt sustainability analytical framework when they make the investment decision to each of the countries they have to look into the issue of debt sustainability. And at the central government level, we are strengthening our uh, uh, macro supervision to this uh, debt sustainability issue uh, overall uh, um, on the, uh, our uh, investment, uh, overseas investment. Uh, and uh, in terms of the individual uh, projects, uh, I think the, uh, of course, a possible approach is that we increase the concessional resources. Uh, however, the fact is that the concess concessional resources is always limited comparing to the huge demand of the infrastructure investment. So the alternative way is to optimize and diversify uh, the business modality of the financing. There are uh, many possibilities of uh, non-debt financing. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, FDIs uh, and also a PPP approach uh, and equity investment and project-based financing. So um, those are possibilities that we can uh, optimize uh, the modality. Um, and also, uh, we, when we look at the debt sustainability issue, uh, we have to uh, improve our analytical, analytical uh, instruments. We have to look at both the asset side as well as the liability side. Not all debts are created equal. Uh, borrow for uh, consumption, that is one issue. But borrow for construction and infrastructure development is another issue that will generate uh, more uh, uh, externality, positive externality. Uh, to the overall economy. So I think we should look at issue in a cautious but dynamic way. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful and, and helps explain uh, a bit more uh, what the Chinese government thinking is. I will get to Caroline in a minute, but I want to follow up uh, with David on a, on a, a, a point. Uh, so in your past, you were once a country economist for Vietnam. Mm. Uh, so I want to draw back on your country economist days. Um, so there's this um, sugar daddy out there who can do some serious investing in your country and fill some infrastructure gaps. Um, but you'd like to capture the most benefits that you can out of this. Um, so from the recipient country side, what is it that you think uh, BRI receiving countries can do 
to maximize the benefits because it's one thing to bring down trade costs and, and have a, uh, you know, an expressway through your country. Uh, but you'd like to have some complementary investments, peripheral investments that generate greater development benefits for the countries. What, what's your view on that? Right, so thanks, Danny. Danny and I worked together on Vietnam starting in 1989, and you know, that was a period where Vietnam was early in its reform program, opening up the economy, creating space for the private sector, stopping hyperinflation, a lot of things. The lesson I took away from all that, I, I remember getting in trouble in the World Bank in one of those early Vietnam reports that Danny had to review. I, I argued that policy reform was more important than money. Uh, and I remember, I don't think the pushback was from Danny, but the pushback was from some senior levels in the World Bank. And we, we settled on policy reform is as important as money. Okay. But I think that the serious point I took away from the Vietnam experience is you know, Vietnam made a lot of dramatic structural and macroeconomic reforms over a period of about three years. And that really set the stage for economic growth. You began to get uh, very dynamic uh, uh, agricultural increases and private sector development, you start to get foreign investment. And for a year or two, the existing infrastructure was adequate. And then they ran into just extraordinary infrastructure bottlenecks. And that's when concessional money coming in, some of the early infrastructure projects, the first road project that had extraordinary rate of return, basically. So I'm a big believer that with the right policy environment, the, uh, concessional assistance can really help low-income countries get going. Uh, and that's why looking at the BRI, I, I, I like the points in Caroline's presentation. Uh, the BRI has the potential to reduce trade costs, but policy reform is certainly as important. I still in my heart feel like it's probably more important, but certainly the combination of policy reform and finance is very powerful. But for low-income countries, you know, there really is this risk of taking on too much debt. Even if the projects are very, very good, you ultimately have to service the debt with exports, with foreign exchange, uh, and that creates risks, and that's really the justification for concessional assistance for low-income countries. Thank you, David. Now that you're at Brookings, you don't have to negotiate your uh, papers with anybody, presumably. Um, Caroline, I want to uh, call upon you as the trade director more than the BRI presenter today. Uh, so there are uh, many trends out there that lead one to think that we're in a somewhat deglobalizing world um, in terms of trade growth, changes in global value chains, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here we have the BRI initiative, which seems to be, uh, I wouldn't say offsetting, but uh, it is going in the opposite direction. It's trying to integrate uh, the global economy at a time when there are many forces out there that are trying to uh, 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 separate out uh, national uh, economic uh, entities from the global environment. So how do you see this? How, how can the global community benefit the most from BRI at a time when it seems like the trends are op in the opposite direction? Um. Let me just start by building on something that David said uh, about how the recipient countries can benefit, because I just also want to make the point, uh, before I answer your question, yeah. that countries can negotiate with China pretty well. It's true that some of the debt is at variable rates, but when we've looked at it and we've talked to finance ministries, we've seen some that's at 2%. So there is room for negotiation. There's room for renegotiation. Um, they can also ask for training from the Chinese. I think that would be an added thing that could be done uh, in these projects where engineers from China help to train local uh, populations in how to build, how to, how to do things. And some of the countries wish they had asked for more of that because I think there is a lot of, of room. So complementary policies as well as, um, as well as the infrastructure will work together, um, but there's also room for negotiation and then evaluate the infrastructure well for, in, for both efficiency as well as social, environmental, and so forth. Um, 
In terms of the, the world moving to deglobalization, I, I hope it's not. I think in some sense the BRI is a protection against that um, because if it's a China-US issue, then China has an alternate market to turn to. Um, so, so this will be important to continue trade growth. That said, what's happening in the BRI would improve welfare for all countries because it's infrastructure. So when the costs go down of transporting through the region, that means that when you export there, it affects external countries as well. So it's very different from a preferential trade agreement where there's diversion. This is infrastructure, so it lowers the cost for everybody. The gains are bigger within the region, but it lowers the cost for everybody. I think one thing that's good about it in, for the rest of the world in thinking about investing in infrastructure is we've seen responses from the US and the EU in also showing they're willing to put up some money for infrastructure um, recently. And if that happens and we fill this gap quicker, that's going to be good for everyone. And finally, just a word about global value chains. Yes, we saw trade. We've been talking about it a lot at this conference. Trade grew twice as fast as income in the 90s and early 2000s. And, and now it's slowed down and it's growing roughly at the pace of income. Um, but we could have that again if some of the rest of the world liberalizes. There are still many economies, most of Africa, uh, big countries like Brazil and India, that have tariffs in the you know, uh, double digits. And if these countries were to liberalize, if they were to work on opening to foreign investment and, uh, and, and improve their business climate, then we could see trade really taking off again and supporting global growth. Well, uh, I hope you're right. Um, on the negotiating with China, um, I remember having to negotiate with the vice minister, and I don't think it's as easy as you think. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so let, let me ask you uh, to follow up on on uh, on this question of uh, of debt. Uh, and I I heard carefully what you said. Uh, you were at the bank when there were these debt relief initiatives, right? HIPIC, MDRI, uh, all sorts of programs uh, uh, to deal with uh, official debt, actually, that was too onerous for low-income countries to pay. Um, I don't think it's a big stretch uh, to look at uh, some of the countries in which the BRI is investing um, and even though it looks at the moment like it's a small part of debt service, we can see in cases you know, like uh, Pakistan or Sri Lanka or others where it's been a big problem. Um, so here, here's my question, Vice Minister. Would it make sense for China to multilateralize further the BRI initiative? I mean, I, I hear that it's decentralized and you know, various commercial and other state banks are involved, but it, it may be in your own interest if one is looking 5, 10, 15 years out to be part of the international system, whether it's the Paris Club or whatever, uh, because there are going to be a number of these countries that are going to run into debt problems. And uh, uh, it's always difficult to do debt rescheduling when the others are not, when no, one, no other creditors are rescheduling, you know what I mean? So, so what's your thinking about that? Is that uh, an avenue of, of thought that might be useful? Um, I think we appreciate the idea of uh, multilateralize uh, the BRI. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, BRI, uh, BRI in nature uh, is not a bilateral initiative. Uh, it's a China initiative, but it is in the nature of international development cooperation. So uh, it is and it should be multilateral. Uh, and also we take a, a proactive approach to cooperate with the multilateral institutions 
uh, and I think we signed an uh, agreement on the uh, cooperation of uh, BRI was six MDBs, including the uh, World Bank, ADB, EBRD, EIB, AIIB, and also the New Development Bank. Uh, we also uh, keep a close uh, contacts with the uh, MF uh, in this regard as well. Uh, so I think we, we appreciate the multilateral approach. Uh, and talking about the debt management itself, we also draw on the analytical uh, uh, debt sustainability framework of uh, uh, MF and the World Bank uh, and closely watching the uh, debt, if, uh, debt sustainability uh, to uh, certain countries, especially the low-income develop, developing countries. And we also did some uh, debt extension uh, and debt restructuring for those uh, low-income developing countries, especially uh, the uh, uh, sub-Sahara uh, African countries. And also the causes of the debt problem is uh, very complicated. Uh, I, uh, I looked into one specific case, that one uh, African country. Uh, several years ago, uh, it is uh, uh, the debt sustainability framework analysis to this country is uh, perfectly sound. They, they have a sound economic growth, they have sound basis of uh, 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 the debt ratio versus the GDP. Uh, however, over the past of years, the external environment, uh, environment turned sharply uh, and the, uh, the price of, of the oil goes down. So there is a sharp reduction of the, uh, the income inflow of this country. And then uh, uh, the local currency of this country uh, depreciated uh, uh, quite a lot um, versus the uh, US dollar. So uh, the, the denominator, the basis of the GDP uh, is shrinking. So, uh, and the debt level even remain the same in abs uh, absolute amount. The debt ratio goes up uh, sharply, dramatically, and it goes into the debt unsustainability. So, uh, so I think we need to uh, closely watch this issue in, in a dynamic way. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue. But, but but we'll take care of it. No, absolutely, and I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, people that look at debt sustainability tend to look at the numerator and not the denominator, and a lot of things can go wrong. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Kaur again because you're our private uh, sector representative on this uh, panel, um, and uh, a lot of the benefits uh, that a country can generate through BRI uh, could be complemented, as David said, with uh, uh, other concessional investments, uh, but I think one is also hoping that it will crowd in uh, the private sector. Um, I think uh, regardless of uh, whether it's uh, straight infrastructure investment or uh, uh, something that will lower, lower the logistics costs or make a country more attractive to FDI, uh, at the end of the day, uh, to be truly beneficial, uh, we should see more private sector investment uh, coming in. Um, how do you see the BRI in terms of being able to crowd in? Does it, does it, is it, for example, is it transparent enough or is there enough forward planning so that the private sector says, uh, you know, we know this project is coming along and if it's successful, uh, there are a lot of other opportunities for us. How do, how do you see that? Thank you. Uh, before I answer the question, just want to correct a uh, misunderstanding you have. I'm actually not with B, A, B, and MRO. I'm with MRO, which stands for ASEAN Plus 3 Macro Macroeconomic Surveillance Office. And we are you know, doing macroeconomic surveillance in support of the CMIM, right? CMIM is a facility that was set up after the Asian financial crisis to provide liquidity support for countries that get hit by these volatility shocks. Uh, but we do cover you know, all the emerging markets, LIC countries, and the, ASEAN, uh, and the plus three countries. So uh, in res you know, your question about uh, private sector uh, involvement, uh, I think that's an important one. Uh, and you know, we already see that happening, especially with the uh, PPP, where 
countries basically try to leverage on the private sector, uh, not just in terms of financing, but in terms of expertise, right? Uh, in order to make sure that the projects are commercially viable, you know? And so for some countries like Philippines, they had a long list of a PPP project that was stuck in the pipeline for some time and you know, just recently beginning to move. Uh, and again, we see that in Indonesia, they're trying to leverage on private sector uh, uh, financing in order to you know, get the imp infrastructure moving. So next, on the, on the, more on the financing and on the expertise side and trying to make sure that the projects are commercially viable uh, or economically viable. Um, but in terms of crowding in, I think, you know, it's, there's so, I mean, infrastructure is an, an enabler, right? And we know that logistic cost is a major issue for many infrastructure, for many uh, private sector. I mean, when we look at, uh, you know, some of these, uh, when we ask the authority sometimes, why isn't this particular uh, uh, in industrial zone, you know, uh, working? It's because the logistic cost of moving products from inland to, up to, to the coast is very high, right? So it's a no-brainer that if you build a road, a highway, or, or you can improve the logistics, it crowding the private sector because it makes the cost much lower and more attractive. And again, the other area where I think we have seen a lot of uh, private sector uh, crowding in is in the internet space, right? This is also infrastructure. I mean, we see that, you know, in, in, in the Philippines where they have built a huge BPO sector because of the reduction in, uh, in, in the cost of telecommunication. We see that in tourism, because, you know, the ex explosion in tourist uh, travel because of the reduction in, in air travel costs. So certainly, I think infrastructure, without the infrastructure, you're not going to get all these private sector activities and investment. Uh, let me follow up uh, and uh, ask you a, a question that you probably wouldn't anticipate. Um, uh, it has to do with um, uh, Suzhou, uh, which had a lot of investment from Singapore uh, and turned out to be very successful much more so than a normal uh, export processing zone. Um, so now China's on the giving end or the investing end, but if you go back 20, 30 years, um, it was a different story. Um, what types of things did China do to benefit more from the investment in Suzhou um, than has happened in other countries? Uh, in Vietnam, as David knows well, you know, there are many, many EPZs, some of them successful, some of them not at all. Um, so it really depends a lot on domestic um, policy intentions. And so in telling us about that, perhaps it will give some guidance to some of the uh, BRI recipients as to how they can maximize the benefits uh, from a substantial foreign investment. Okay, uh, thank you, Danny. Uh, I personally did not look into the specific cases in Suzhou, uh, but I think uh, as a, 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 a general observation on uh, how China's development uh, take more advantage from these uh, uh, FDIs, uh, I think uh, a key principle is that you, you have to be clear with your own development vision and, and plan. Uh, you have to look at your binding constraints in your economy uh, and how can you uh, uh, take advantage of your own comparative advantage uh, at the same time uh, draw international resources uh, to compensate on the, uh, uh, the uh, shortages in your economy. Uh, so I think uh, that's why we also feel with the BRI initiative, uh, the country initiative, uh, is very important. So the BRI uh, projects has to be fit into uh, the participating country's own development plan. So um, uh, we draw this less lesson basically from our own experience of development. I think that's uh, David, wise advice. This? Yes, David. Um, yeah, so I think this whole question of Chinese special zones is very interesting. China started out with four zones uh, at the beginning of reform, but only one of the four, Shenzhen, has really been very successful. So I like to emphasize that within a very short time, 
whatever the special policy privileges of the special zones had been expanded to about 35 cities in China, right? Suzhou was not one of the original zones, but it was one of those 35 cities. So you really had an enormous part of the Chinese economy that was opened up to foreign trade and investment. So when I look at other developing countries, you know, India is big enough that it might draw some lessons from China. Everybody else is small compared to China. And so then a place like Vietnam to have special zones, you know, you're basically providing openness to a pretty small part of the economy, whereas China provided openness to most of GDP very quickly. Okay, uh, uh, point taken. The, the, um, the issue of trying to blend uh, BRI investments with the development strategy, complementary investments, uh, attract the FDI and other private sectors, uh, requires some sort of a structure. So David, I want to come back to you because Vietnam uh, was a case where uh, there was a consultative group, right? Indonesia was a case in the past where consultative groups were quite uh, prevalent. And this was a, a way in which donors uh, and investors could get together in a coordinated way. Now, the, the difficulty with the BRI is that, as you yourself said, Vice Minister, it's not well coordinated, perhaps, even inside China, because you have these different players. Um, but I'm sure you'll fix that. Um, you've only been Vice Minister since June, so I, you can't expect too much. Um, but I'm sure you'll get to it. Um, but my question, David, is how do you imagine for country X, Right, it's somewhere on the map there, showing a nice red road through it. Um, what's the right mechanism, right? If it if it's only donor money, consultative group might work. But if it's the private sector, public sector, domestic resources, how do you imagine this working so that the countries get the maximum benefit out of BRI? Right. So I think this is a very good question. So I think one thing that China and the World Bank can agree on is, you know, we, everyone likes this rhetoric about ownership. So the ideal situation is that the recipient country, the country that's getting the investment, has the capacity to set really good development policies and have an investment plan and prioritize, and then China or the World Bank or private investors, they all fit into that plan. But we know, Danny, that, you know, that a lot of countries we're talking about have relatively weak governance, and you're not necessarily going to get that optimal situation. I agree with you that where it's mostly concessional money coming in, the consultative group mechanism can be a pretty good substitute. But I wish we put more effort into really building up the capacity of governments. You know, Caroline mentioned that countries can be asking China for technical assistance. I noticed that in the last year, China's given the IMF a $50 million grant for technical assistance along the Belt and Road countries with a lot of focus on debt sustainability. So that's great. But on the other, you know, before you get to debt problems, I think we need better project selection. So Zojiai, I wish China would give some money, maybe, maybe the World Bank, but to someone to do some technical assistance on project preparation, you know, and project management so we get better projects in a lot of these countries. So I don't think there's any simple answer, Danny, but th those are my quick reactions. Okay, um, pretty soon we're gonna move to uh, some questions from the audience, but I wanna um, close up on a, a few points maybe that have uh, emerged out of what I think is a very, uh, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think we focused a lot at the beginning on debt sustainability, and I think we, we have some better clarity on, on that. Um, on the issue that you just raised, David, about project selection, um, I think the question is, um, how early in the process does one get to discuss the projects that might be in the uh, BRI? So my first question to you is, in terms of the project selection, um, has it already been set? Uh, or are there some uh, parameters that are more flexible? And the second part, uh, Vice Minister, has to do with implementation. So I think, uh, uh, other panelists mentioned, or you yourself mentioned, hypothetical uh, or illustrative African country whose fortunes changed. Um, there have been some issues raised about, uh, you know, implementation of, of Chinese projects in Africa. Um, and so, again, I'm sure lessons have been extracted from that 
so that these uh, situations don't occur with great frequency in other countries in which you uh, will be investing. So my question really is, in this decentralized world that you describe, um, what's the mechanism by which earlier project identification and uh, some parameters around uh, implementation can be effectively uh, discussed? I mean, giving a TA loan to the IMF is, is fine. It's a grant. Grant, okay, T yeah, sorry. Yeah, of course the IMF needs money. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's fine on the debt sustainability, but, but on the point of project selection and project implementation, what, what's your vision about how this can be improved? Uh, well, um, in terms of the uh, uh, project selection, uh, I think that's why I appreciate your idea of uh, uh, multilateralization. I think we can take advantage of the MDBs in those areas because uh, MDBs, they have a lot of experience in project identification and the project, uh, um, uh, project preparation. Uh, BRI, uh, as, uh, as you and I uh, both mentioned, is a quite decentralized approach. And most of the projects will be done on a commercial basis. So we cannot really imagine a kind of a, a centrally planned economy approach that we will establish another international organization called BRI a Bank or something, and every project needs to be reviewed and approved by this, uh, by, 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 by this institution. Uh, that is impossible. I, I think it will be uh, continue to be a relatively decentralized uh, approach. Uh, and also, uh, it is a kind of a network participated by uh, different BRI uh, participating countries. So uh, again, countries' ownership and countries' initiative is very important to suggest, to propose, and to identify the projects. However, we can take advantage of the expertise of, of, of the MDBs. We would encourage uh, the uh, BRI participating countries to approach the MDBs uh, and to uh, ask for the help uh, in terms of the project selection and the project design. We are also uh, thinking about and exploring the possibility uh, to develop a kind of a mechanism uh, which could more uh, integrate the expertise of the multilateral development banks and better serve the needs of the, the BRI participating countries. Thank you. Well, I think that would be great. Um, and I think, um, uh, I think some institutional mechanism that encourages uh, BRI uh, participating countries uh, to seek outside views, it doesn't have to be the World Bank, but it could be uh, other MDBs. Uh, in the project selection stage would be, I think, very uh, helpful. Danny, can I just come in there for yes, one minute? Yes, please. Um, I think that one of the, I mean, an important value of our report is that it will have some recommendations on all of these issues, on project selection, okay. on government procurement, on complementary policies, um, uh, on other you know, areas where we can maximize the benefits. So I think we can leverage that <coughs> to offer technical assistance and help improve the quality and selection and really maximize the benefits of this initiative. Okay, I, we look forward to that uh, part of the report because I think this is uh, a very important uh, point. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, uh, turn to the audience for questions, and then at the end we will give each of the panelists a couple of minutes, two or three, if we have time to sum up uh, where they are, uh, uh, and I'll try perhaps to uh, do the same. Um, can you explain perhaps how the questions will be delivered? Uh, is there a microphone out there? How will that happen? Okay, if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, and tell us who you are. And here's the part of my moderating where I will be extremely tough. <laughs> you will be asking a question that is one sentence in length and has a question mark at the end. <laughs> okay, 
So your life history is wonderful. I, we'd love to hear it, but we don't want to hear it right now. Uh, so best. questions are interrogative with a question mark at the end. Okay. This lady goes first. Uh, I'm with Bloomberg. Um, a question for uh, Zhou Fujian and Caroline. Uh, we are living in the world with uh, the two biggest economies uh, uh, increasing at odds. Do you see this environment uh, together with global tapering uh, a challenge or opportunity for Belt and Road uh, going forward? Um, why is that? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll take three questions. That one is the trade wars question for the two of you to answer. Uh, second question. Uh, Stefania Palma, Financial Times. I have a question for Ms. Zoll. Um, we have seen uh, Malaysia push back heavily against China-backed projects. Uh, some China-backed pipelines have been canceled. The East Coast Rail Link, which is the key BRI project in Malaysia, is suspended and Malaysia is renegotiating it with China. Um, to what degree are you willing to accommodate some of their requests? considering that uh, probably not doing so might uh, heighten the malaise that there has, that has been bubbling up in some of the other <coughs> countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka against Belt and Road. Okay, the questions are getting tougher. Uh, <laughs> let's take a third and while you think about what you want to say. Third question, anybody? Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Cara and I'm from University of Toronto. Uh, my question is also to Madam Zhou. I think uh, on your point about point, uh, product selection and product management, and from my research that um, the China, the Chinese railway sector has been viciously, if not aggressively, trying to export both high speed rail and conventional rail. I'm just asking, what are the mechanisms for which recipient countries or participant countries can choose from high speed rail and conventional rail? Thank you. Do they have a choice? Okay. Okay, um, you want to say a word on trade wars yeah. and then we'll the give, other questions are all for you. We'll give Madame Zoe <laughs> a minute to uh, think. Um, so we actually did some analysis on a China-US trade war, uh, looking at what would happen if both sides uh, put 25% tariffs on each other. We also looked at the initial 50 billion kind of full trade war scenario and then a trade war scenario with a shock to investor confidence. And in one sense, if it's just tariffs on each other, um, the overall global effects are, are pretty small. There are big effects on China and on the US. There's actually somewhat positive effects on other countries because of trade diversion. So countries can displace US and China and um, countries can displace China in the US and, and actually benefit a little bit. But the real threat, and I think we've seen a little bit of it this week, is that the idea of a trade war and disrupting global value chains can really shock investor confidence. And if investors decide to remain on the sideline, this rebound in growth we've had recently, and in trade as well, is really driven by investors. And if we have a shock to investment, then that will go away, and it could be very bad for growth. So I think that's the real danger of going down this path and of, and of tariff escalation. So with respect to the BRI, um, it, you know, the interaction is still that it would, would help support global value chains in the region, but I think overall we have to think of trade tensions and escalating tariffs as a threat. Okay, thank you. Some tough questions for you. <laughs> okay, uh, let me start with the question of the trade war. Uh, we are against the trade war. We always believe that trade war is a problem rather than a solution to the imbalance and challenge of the globalization. Uh, I think we cannot say that uh, trade war would be a favorable environment to BRI. Uh, and the problem of trade war has been elaborated by uh, Caroline just now. But I would rather to look at the issue uh, from uh, uh, another perspective. I can understand why there are some people who are in favor of the trade war, uh, because they feel frustrated that the benefit of the globalization is not evenly shared by, uh, by, by every person and by each of the country. So that is the challenge of the globalization. 
However, to tackle the challenge of this globalization, we need uh, efforts from both the national level and then international level. At the national level, it is the sovereign government's responsibility to ensure the development, uh, uh, the outcome of the development in this particular country would be appropriately shared by the most majority of the people. So uh, uh, the sovereign government need to put appropriate policy in place. Like in China, we are a beneficiary of, uh, we benefited from the globalization. But this benefit is also not evenly distributed to the Chinese people. So that's why we launched the uh, three-year program of uh, poverty reduction and try to eliminate um, absolute poverty by the end of uh, 2020. <coughs> and the central government allocate a lot of resources uh, to that. I think that other countries should do the same. And at the international level, we should enhance the international development cooperation. And I think BRI is part of it. Uh, the BRI is aimed to, uh, uh, to bring uh, more countries into the process of development and let more countries benefit from the uh, globalization. Uh, this is my response to the first question. Then the second question is how do we look at uh, the uh, Malaysia's uh, cancellation, some of the proposed projects together with China. I think we fully uh, respect the Malaysians' decision making and their judgment. It's part of uh, our vision of uh, country initiative and country ownership. I think Malaysia, they did uh, uh, adequate uh, communication with the Chinese side. They decided to cancel those projects due to their analysis for the debt sustainability. I think it's a good thing for us to uh, respect uh, the country's own judgment on that. So, um, and then third question is uh, whether country have the choice of uh, high speed railway or the conventional one. Uh, yes, absolutely, 100% yes. Uh, it's upon the country's own decision uh, to choose uh, the, to build up a, 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 a high speed railway or the uh, a conventional speed railway. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, Chinese partners uh, from, from, from our side, they also have their choices on uh, whether the particular uh, project is fit into their own comparative advantages and skills and resources. So I think it's uh, um, uh, choices of, uh, uh, of both parties. Uh, it, makes two to t it takes two to tango. I think it's the same logic. Thank you. Okay, we will have time for one more round of questions before we, uh, this gentleman here on the left. If you're in the back, it's hard for me to see, so you'll have to stand up or wave. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Sheard, Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, a question uh, perhaps for the Vice Minister or maybe other panelists may want to weigh in. How do you reconcile um, the fact that this is a very decentralized uh, approach based on commerciality, as you've stressed, with the need for coordination across a vast region and many countries to capture the benefits of the connectivity uh, that has been emphasized. In other words, if this is a China initiative, uh, doesn't China need to play a very strong coordinating role as well? Okay, we'll take that one on board. Uh, commercialization versus coordination. Uh, Coordination has never been a problem in China, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. Um, can I get a second or third yeah, question? Right. First row, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Satya Yuda. I'm a member of parliament from Indonesia. I'd just like to uh, see your perspective in terms of the recent new initiative raised by the Indonesians with regard to the indo pacifics So how your views, uh, Belt and Road initiative versus the indo pacific initiative so far? Very direct and simple question. Okay, and there, anyone else that knows about the uh, Indo Pacific Initiative can also chime in uh, on our panel. Okay, do I have a third, last question from There's the one audience? In the back. Okay, please.
Can you stand up so we can see who you are? <laughs> Hello, um, thank you very much. My question is for Mrs. Zhu. My name is Ibrahim, I'm an economist at Samudra, Indonesia. Um, Mrs. Zhu, do you have any comment regarding the labor issue in Belt and Road Initiative that in some countries, uh, labor market is a little bit disrupted with the fact that the projects are mostly employed uh, Chinese workers and not local workers. Do you have any comments on that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, on that one, we can also, after you answer, we can pass it on to David or Caroline or others who want to comment. Um, you seem very popular. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me start with the, uh, uh, the first question. How can we uh, address the balance between the uh, commercial approach and the uh, uh, coordination. Uh, I think this is the very reason why the BRI uh, is in place. Uh, well, uh, without the BRI, of course, each of the countries will still do their own development plan and uh, develop their own individual projects. But we feel that it is necessary to uh, put in place a common vision. So the BRI is uh, uh, actually uh, put the vision in place. Uh, in place, and then uh, that would inspire the participating countries to think uh, uh, on the same line uh, and to the better coordination when they plan their e each of the individual projects and economies. Uh, as what has been made clear by uh, Caroline, why the coordinated efforts is more desi desirable rather than the, uh, each of the individual ones. So that is the, the rationale for this uh, BRI initiative. Um, however, what kind of uh, specific <coughs> mechanism we need to put in place is something we are still uh, learning by doing. Uh, this year marks the uh, fifth year of this uh, BRI. So when we uh, uh, push this uh, initiative forward, we also draw lessons uh, from our experience. As I said, we are improving uh, our dialogues and communications with each of the participating countries in a bilateral way. At the same time, we are trying to develop a kind of uh, multilateral framework uh, which would uh, 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 enable a kind of a platform uh, for each of the participating countries to uh, take advantage of. And they can bring each of the thoughts of the projects on the same platform, and that will uh, uh, enhance the coordination in the future. Um, and regarding the, um, uh, the third question regarding the uh, labor issue, uh, I think uh, it is true in some cases that uh, some projects, we, uh, the Chinese enterprises, they brought about labor force uh, uh, from China uh, to make the constructions. It is mainly due to the consideration of uh, uh, minimizing the cost. Uh, I think uh, because um, majority of the projects is based on the, com uh, the commercial, uh, uh, commercial lenders uh, and commer commercial constructors, so it is understandable that for those enterprises, they have to consider about cost effectiveness. But as a policy issue, uh, I think we encourage, we at the level of the government, we encourage the participating enterprises, Chinese enterprises, mm -hmm. well, to the large extent possible mm -hmm. to take advantage of the local labor force. That will uh, strengthen the ownership of the country uh, for those projects. Uh, again, there will be, I think we are fighting uh, uh, among different considerations. On one hand, we need to maximize the development effectiveness in the participating countries by use more local labor force. On the other hand, we still need to uh, uh, keep the individual project uh, financially sound in terms of uh, uh, the cost effectiveness and also in terms of uh, control the debt level and the, the debt cost of the individual country. So uh, it's a comprehensive consideration. Uh, regarding the second question, uh, I, I, I do apologize. I didn't pick up uh, so which initiative uh, you're talking about regarding the Indonesia. I, Danny, you, you, you know? Uh, no, I think it was Indo-Pacific. Uh, 
I, I don't know anything about it myself, but uh. do you want to tell us what it is, and then we'll see if we can answer it? <laughs> do you know anything about it? Well, this is quite a surprise if you never heard in the Pacific, but it has been uh, proposed uh, lately by the, uh, you know, the ASEAN leaders. You know, as you may know that uh, this, uh, two days ago uh, there was a meeting uh, ASEAN leaders in, uh, in Bali as well. And they are also touching a bit about the Indo-Pacific initiative. So what I do understand because of the Indo-Pacific basically is the same thing with the Belt and Road, with a different, different kind of region, you know, because of uh, from the Pacific region down to Indonesia. And the Indo uh, Belt and Road, previously known in one belt and one route, okay. is, is also touching from the Indonesia up to yeah. uh, the rest of the Asia uh, country. So I'll just, you. whether this is complement or not. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we, 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 we know this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, initiative. I just didn't pick up uh, the specific uh, wording. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, we see it. Uh, it's a complemental rather than a, a competitive. Uh, BRI initiative is not a, a, a single initiative which is uh, separated from uh, <coughs> any others. Uh, BRI need to be connected with other development initiatives, also with the individual countries' initiatives uh, of their own development plan. So we see that there is a good chance for BRI uh, to be connected with the efforts of the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, our vision of globalization actually is a, is a global connectivity. Uh, BRI is part of the global connectivity. And in the development effectiveness uh, of the BRI, uh, of course, will not limit it to the BRI participating countries. There will be positive spillover effectiveness to all of the world. So uh, we are very much uh, looking forward to the, uh, the connecti connectivity uh, between and among the different global initi initiatives as well. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so what I would like to do now is, since you've had ample opportunity to answer all these questions. I will uh, ask uh, David, Dollar, uh, Dr. Kaur, and Caroline for one minute if there's something that you would like people to take away uh, on the economics of BRI that uh, is, is important in your mind. Right, so thanks, Danny. So of all the things we discussed, to me the most important is the need to complement infrastructure investment with policy reform. There's a lot of need for trade liberalization and other investment climate reform in South Asia, in East Africa. We didn't talk much about India today at all, but a free trade agreement between India and China would have huge benefits, or it could be nested in something larger like RCEP, but it would have to be much more ambitious than the proposals up till now. So the infrastructure is good, but policy reform is even more important. So you haven't changed in haven't 20 changed. years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess I can't learn. <laughs> Dr. Kaur. Well, I probably should start by saying that I agree with uh, David that the importance of uh, policy. And I think that's the strength of the region because after the Asian financial crisis, they have been, you know, reforming and strengthening the fundamentals. And that's, you know, helped them to weather this kind of uh, volatility shocks. But having said that, uh, I... You know, I, I think infrastructure is extremely important. It's an enabler. And to have an initiative like BRI, you know, is an opportunity, in my view. Of, obviously, there are costs. And I think we heard the, 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 the risk, uh, uh, you know, today in terms of project selection, in terms of implementation, in terms of changes in the external environment, in terms of, and so even if you do everything right, it can still go wrong, right? So then you need uh, some kind of a mechanism for debt resolution and all that. So all that should be part of the package, and I'm sure Caroline is looking into all that. <laughs> so, but I, I, I do see you know, BRI is a great opportunity for the region. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Kaur. Yeah, Caroline. Um, I, one thing I, w I, I guess I want to emphasize three things. There was a question about coordination, and I think that regional agreements could be leveraged as well as the MDBs. Um, or maybe some sort of, of new agreement. I think coordination is very important, as I mentioned uh, during my presentation. And 
we do see some projects that aren't well coordinated with each other, worries about two ports maybe that are too close or something like that. During the other huge infrastructure uh, plan, if we think about the Marshall Plan, actually that was the origins of the OECD was as a coordinator for the Marshall Plan investments. So I think some sort of coordinator can help, including um, uh, potentially the MDBs a little bit more uh, to help also multilateralize the initiative. Um, uh, there was also a question about procurement, and this goes to David's point about uh, policy. That's another area where local policy can help. So uh, countries set their own procurement laws, and China will abide by the laws of the country. So there are things that countries can do to ensure uh, local labor participation in these. There's also a WTO agreement on, on government procurement that, that countries could choose to engage in. Um, and finally, and, and again, just to emphasize what David said as well, because I think it's super important, if you want the private sector response, you have to do get all the policy right. The infrastructure alone isn't enough though I think the infrastructure is also important. So it's, it's sort of 50-50. You, you get half the bang from each one, but the bang is much bigger than double if, if you do both. Um, and, then the, but, and then my final point is on data and transparency. I think that's something that could easily be improved. Um, We've gathered our own data. There should be a data source out there that China and other countries contribute to, and we can have a little bit more information. Because ultimately, to make the right decisions on the investments and to think about issues like debt and so forth, we need the data. So it's just my final point is a call for more data and transparency. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do before we break is uh, give you a few takeaways. I was told by the organizers that if I did that, uh, there would be a bonus uh, available for being a moderator. So uh, I'm interested in that. Um, so for me, I think there were there are many takeaways, and I think this was a very uh, uh, informative, very frank, and a very productive session. I think we uh, we really exchanged good views and got more information on a topic that's really important. Um, so for me, uh, takeaway one is that uh, countries have to be uh, more careful in uh, accepting uh, BRI investments. Um, Caroline said they should negotiate better. Maybe there needs to be some grant fund for uh, helping uh, countries to negotiate better. Because if you're Guinea-Bissau and you have to negotiate with China, it's a little bit difficult. Um, so I think that's a takeaway. Uh, the second takeaway is the multilateralization point, which I am glad that uh, you found some resonance with you, because I think it is uh, a global initiative that requires more uh, multilateral uh, connections. Uh, the third uh, has to do with project selection and a link to a clear development strategy, which you, Vice Minister, stressed and others did as, as well. Um, and I think. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's probably not ideal to have uh, these projects seen as commercially financeable by independent actors in China, I think. Uh, there's a problem with that with respect to A, coordination, B, actually for the government, there's a moral hazard problem because at the end of the day, if you have a dead loan in country X, you know, that state bank is gonna come to the Ministry of Finance uh, for relief. So um, there's a moral hazard problem there, which uh, I think compounds the coordination failure problem. I think we had a, a good discussion on the affordability and debt sustainability issue. And I think that that's something that uh, 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 I think China will learn by doing, as you said, uh, in this respect, because now they're in a different uh, situation. Uh, for many years, they were recipients of capital. Now they're providers of capital. So you're a creditor and debt sustainability becomes uh, key. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for coming. I think that uh, in a world in which we tend to feel a lot of uh, uh, decentralizing forces, uh, the BRI could be uh, one of these uh, that brings countries together and brings regions together. Uh, if it is 
continually improved, and I think the panel provided many suggestions. Uh, I think it can maximize the benefits for those countries participating in the BRI and in the long term uh, be in the interests of China uh, as well. So with that, thank you all, and thank you. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panel. Great job. <laughs>